suppose really something would give us a definition of who we really were, our class position or our national position or our geographic origins or where our grandparents came from. And I don't think any one thing any longer will tell us who we are. The question that I'm going to put to John is a kind of million dollar question really, which is how did this idea come about and why did you choose this particular way of telling, um, well, as you can see it's called the Stuart Hall Project, it's not exactly telling the Stuart Hall story, but how, how did this come about and why did you do it this way, John? I've known Stuart uh, since 87 and about three years ago it seemed to a number of us that he was getting weaker. He's not been well for a long time. So the, the idea was to do this project, collaborative project with him on the notion of the visual. And as that project went on, it struck us that, in fact, the real visual question we needed to ask was how much his own archive spoke about him and his ideas, and whether we could get some of his theoretical insights to speak to that archive. So the project started initially working with him. Yeah, so, so we, we started off working together and then it became clear that he couldn't really do it. He was not well enough. That project was finished. It was, it's called The Unfinished Conversation. It's a three screen piece using about half the material here. And it's now on at the Tate for five months. So you can go and see that. At the end of that, it seemed to me that there was still quite a lot of material left and that something else could be done. Uh, and so the Stuart Hall project grew really out of the idea that having done one project, which was us speaking about him, it might be worth doing something where he spoke to, to us and the world. Um, and that's really how it evolved. The Unfinished Conversation is, uses quite a lot of the same material, but essentially what it was trying to do was to, was to uh, work out whether this notion of identity that Stuart's been working with for a long time, which is the idea that identities emerge at the intersection of, of the psychic and the historical, whether that could be applied to his own life. Right? Um, so uh, essentially, once that thesis was done, and I think we, we pretty much had it locked by 68, <laughs> we stopped. That's 45 minutes, three screens, 45 minutes each. But there was still from 68 to 2000, and there was still a lot of material. So the question then was, what could you, what else could we do with that, which wasn't just addressing this, you know, oh, that's better. <laughs> this question of identity. Uh, uh, and so suddenly all the other things that got slightly more elliptical a treatment, the new left, questions of equality, Thatcher, all of those things were still outstanding. And so that's what we decided to use the rest of our time addressing. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> Can I give you one? <laughs> yes, a question. Um, sorry, I just declared a little bit of a vested interest before I start. In the, <clears throat> at the moment, I'm involved in a project concerning the latter years of Nyron Bevan and his relationship with Paul Robson. I won't bang on about it too much, but it's a subject which is right there up on the screen, what we've seen tonight. It's very much part of it. One of the things that's emerging out of that, and it was actually alluded to quite strongly at the end, was Stuart Hall's feeling that the end of the 70s signalled an actual like, end of people talking to one another in a meaningful way in that we have con conducted political debate throughout the 20th century and the events at the end of the 70s kind of terminated it. 
you know. Since then, I get the feeling that with the advent of social media, etc., etc., maybe new ways are emerging. I don't know if you can enlarge on that for us as it went on, but I was on the NHS march in Manchester, and the thing that came out of that day more than anything else was the people there just wanted a way whereby we can all relate and talk to one another again, and we can talk to people at the top of the tree again, because it all seems to have just stopped. I mean, one of the beautiful things about working with the archival is that sometimes you just catch things in flight, not quite sure where they're going, because the person who's either articulating the idea or is the recipient of it on screen isn't themselves clear, because they're in their present, you know. Um, and that was the, the wonderful thing for me about returning to, to Stuart's uh, thought processes during the course of this. Because I, you know, the, the comment you're talking about comes, we were talking about this earlier, I think from 89, I've forgotten exactly when. Um, I must look it up because it's come up so many times, it clearly affects a lot of you, so I must look up exactly when. I think it's from 89, and, and he, you could just feel that he senses something, some things, but he senses it emotionally. He's not, he's not quite, he hasn't got his head around it yet. And, and of course, you know, 20 years later or 15 years later, he understands it. He understands that this is now, you know, the, the, the outline of the neoliberal moment being put into place. What he feels first is, is the end of something. But of course, now if you speak to him, he'll also tell you it's the beginning of something. <laughs> um, and he would spend the, a lot of the 80s, you know, whether in the New Times moment or the critique of Thatcherism, trying to then think about how one goes around, <coughs> around it or through it. Um, so yes, no, I agree. I agree. Okay, I'm going to take one more question, and then I'm going to ask Emily to say something. It's just on the question of identity. Um, Can you hear at the top? Yeah. Oh, I was going to say, bad luck. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, on the question of identity, what, what struck me about the, the film seen in the 1950s, <coughs> black people from the Caribbean, the West Indies, not identifying themselves as black, not identifying themselves as having a, that sort of particularistic identity, having a more universal outlook. So, what, you know, for example, when he went on his road trip around Europe, he had uh, Homer's The Odyssey and James Joyce Ulysses, and I got the sense that he saw human culture as belonging to him regardless of the colour of his race. And yet by the 1970s, by 1978, he's celebrating um, black culture um, as something that the whites need to recognise. Uh, and there seems to be a profound shift there. Um, and, 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 in the, and then ultimately in the 1980s, he seems to be preoccupied with his own personal identity and talking about how identities are, are fluid and hybrid. Um, and to what extent is that, is that quite a sad... Uh, story really, in that he seems to have lost this sort of more universalistic outlook that we're human beings first. Um, I think you're misreading something, and it's important that, that we nail this on the head. You know, um, um, Stuart Hall comes to this country in 1951 not as an outsider, he's a British subject because he's come from a colony. So he would have read Homer and, you know, he knew of him because he's part of, okay, he's on the periphery, but he's, he's part of this world. So, yes, there is a kind of universalism, but it was a problematic one because for the three quarters of the world under British rule, it was a very uh, problematic uh, uh, version of universalism. You had to find your place in it. And finding your place in it was what he then spends his time worrying about. But, but it doesn't just happen in the 70s. I mean, you know, there's this distinction people make between the coming of race and, and something else called, you know, left politics, which is more universal. Well, you know, if you look at the film in 64, um, there's a radio program called Generational Strangers. 
right now and he's speaking then about the coming multiculture because he's worrying about what will happen to these 12 year olds who he can sense will not all fit in mm. yeah he can sense that and he's trying to figure out what will happen if they don't fit in where they'll go well of course we know where they'll go because in the 70s they say we don't want to be part of it because this thing doesn't want us do you know what i mean now that's happening at the same time as he's with Hogger and the others trying to set up the center, 64. You know, so the idea of race is something supplementary to his thinking. It's not true. He's worrying about the two things at the same time. He always has done. He doesn't just go to it later on. You know, he always worried about this question of becoming. And the other thing that, that you know, the, the film keeps alluding to is that for the black people who've settled here, their colour becomes the central political problem for white people. So it's, you know, that turn to race, as, as, as you're putting it, is imposed upon those black subjects who, you know, so clearly all black people that I've ever come across responded to that as it happened during the 60s and during the 70s. People like Stuart were the ones who were beginning to think about it in more intellectual kind of terms. But, you know, I don't think he's, I don't think he's the one who's turning his back on universalism. I think, I think it's the other way around, actually. But I can see somebody else is about to ask. So can I just hold you for a minute? Because I'd like to hear Emily's, Emily's, Emily's response.